Okay, so today uh, we are going to have a, a new topic. So, so far we have been basically talking about uh, what is involved in the rendering pipeline, right. We have not really discussed issues in terms of what do we need for modeling, right. So, we, we, we have considered very simple primitives like line, circles when it came to drawing those primitives. So, now we actually will start talking about how can we model various geometrical objects, right. So, to start with we will uh, look at the design of curves, right. And one of the motivation here is that we would like to have the smooth curves passing through let us say some data points or giving us a shape which we would like to use it for different models, right. So, if you look at as a first degree of approximation to be able to design a curve, what you may do is just use collection of lines, right or polylines. So, these are nothing but collection of lines which you see here and the resulting shape is some sort of a capture of a curvilinear shape, right. So, so what we observe immediately that the shape is not smooth, right. It is a collection of points joined by these lines and the resulting shape what we get is not smooth, right. So, the motivation here is that we would like to design curves which also have some smoothness. So, smoothness right now we are considering in uh, a sort of a spoken language. See whatever we see is smooth that is what we are referring to smooth, but the mathematical definition we will look at later on, right. Okay. So, if we uh, look at some of the higher let us say degree of approximation to be able to design curves, we can look at various representation of curves, right. So, for instance, there is this explicit form or expli explicit representation of curves, where you consider y is equal to f x, right. So, for each point value x, you have a value y, right. The other representation is an implicit representation right, where you actually get the these points on the curve by solving an equation or set of equations, right. And examples of these we have seen earlier, right. And the parametric curves where we have the values for x and y or the point in uh, Cartesian space given through a parameter. So, x is equal to x t and y is equal to y t, where t is a parameter, right. So, let us look at a uh, little more in details about these. So, explicit representation as we observed is actually a functional form where y is equal to f x and so, which is obtained by just a plot of the function, right. So, for a given x you plot y, the x is defined in an interval let us say a and b. So, when it comes to uh, do the computation for drawing or plotting, it is a fairly simple thing to do. You just run various values of x and obtain the values of y and plot them, right. Now, if you want to check, this is uh, at times very useful that we would like to know whether a particular point lies on curve or not. So, in this representation it is fairly simple, right, because it is going to satisfy this, right. But the problem is that you cannot have closed or multi value curves, because it is a univalued function for one value of x you have one value of y, right. So, we cannot have a multi value kind of a function or a closed 
curve v 1 right. So, let us see now the implicit representation. In the case of implicit representation, you have the definition of curves given uh, implicitly as solution of equations right or solution of system of equation. Right. So, for instance, a line could be defined as A x plus B y plus C equals to 0. Right. A circle can be defined as x square plus y square minus r square equal to 0 right. and a general conic section or a quadratic curve can be defined as A x square plus 2 B x y C y square plus 2 D d x plus 2 e y plus f equals to 0 right. So, again if you want to check whether a particular point lies on curve is straightforward right and here we have the advantage that this actually this representation enable, enables us to have closed and multi value curves right. The next uh, representation which is what we are going to pursue it is the parametric curves right. So, here what we have is position on the curve is basically defined through a parameter right. So, a parameter u defined in r right gives me the values of x and y's for the various values of parameter u right. So, this is the, the curve in 2D. A simple simplest example we observe is of line right. So, I define a parameter u let us say between 0 and 1 right which gives me a parametric definition of line between the end points a and b right. So, this is the parametric curve C u for the line between A and B right. Now, if you look at from the point of view of determining whether a point lies on a curve or not, it is not straightforward right, because you have to solve for the parameter u or whatever parameter you are using to be able to know whether the corresponding point x u y u is what you are looking for. Right. So, it is not a direct analytical substitution. Right. It is simple to render because all you have to do is change the parameter for the definition of the curve and then obtain the corresponding x and y values right. So, this is referring to the planar curve, but you can also extend the this to space curve all you need is a third dimension z defined through the parameter u right. So, space curve is just a direct extension and this also gives you the advantage of to be able to define the multi value right because you are basically traversing along the curve through the parameter right ok. So, that is what we are going to basically concentrate on definition of these parametric curves ok. So, uh, what it also renders or gives us is the ability to have what we call as free form curves right. So, free form means there is no particular form, but the way we just draw it right that is what we call it as a free form. So, that free form nature of curves can be obtained through parametric curves ok. So, generally they are modeled as piecewise polynomials right and they, they could be two let us say aspects looked at from the point of view of their design. So, you may want to have curves which are interpolating a set of data 
right. So, you are given set of data points and what you want is a smooth curve passing through those data points, right. The other uh, way to look at is some sort of an approximation of a shape which is in your mind. So, what you have as a designer a shape of the curve or let us say surface, right and you want to design that shape using the control handles or the manipulators in the parametric curves, right. So, you want to approximate a shape which is in mind for you to design, right. So, often we hear the term splines, right. So, splines are basically parametric curves. And in fact, if we uh, go back a little bit in the history, how this word spline came. So, earlier uh, this was required for design of let us say the surfaces used in ship design, right. So, where you had a smooth surface being designed for ships. So, what they basically did in order to have that particular shape, they took a sheet, right. So, and what they did? They put some weights at various points on that sheet, right. And by changing the weights, they obtained some shape which they wanted to have, right. So, it is a flexible sheet which they could manipulate the shape of which by attaching weights to this at various points, right. So, for instance here a similar example is being uh, illustrated. You have these weights which are also called as ducts in the shape of ducts which are attached to this wooden or a plastic flexible sheet, right, at various points. So, by manipulating the location of these weights right and the amount of weights you would see a different shape of the sheet right just because of these weights are going to change their locations and the amount you will have a particular shape of that sheet right so that is what was referred to as splines that's where the word is coming from okay so, that is what the idea here is that you have this flexible kind of a sheet and these are some sort of weights attached which in turn governing the shape of this curve, right. So, this was done just by a manual or let us say the mental mapping of the shape one wanted to have and adjust these weights, okay. So, that is what we want to use in, in reference to design of parametric curves, same similar idea, okay. So, now let us try to uh, see a particular type of splines, right. So, we look at cubic splines which are uh, defined as a cubic polynomial of the parameter, right. So, this is the cubic polynomial of the parameter t defined let us say in an interval t 1 and t 2, right. So, this I can write as a summation of some coefficients b i's and the polynomial t, right. And this p t which I obtain as the parametric curve has the components let us say x t or y t and z t, right. So, these are nothing but the same uh, polynomial using in x and in y, right. So, you can consider these b's to be some sort of a vector having x and y's and z's, right. And if I take the derivative of this, of this polynomial p t, I get this, right. 
which is given a, here as this. So, these derivatives are in some sense capturing the tangent vector at some location, right. These derivatives are nothing but some sort of tangent vectors at the at some points of the curve, right. So, so with this familiarity of let us say polynomials defining a parametric curve, let us try to have a particular kind of splines which we can obtain, right. So, what are we saying now? We are saying that let us say given the two endpoints P1 and P2, the position vectors P1 and P2, the tangent vectors P1 prime and P2 prime at the two endpoints, right, let us say which are defined for the parameter value T1 and T2, how do I obtain this cubic spline, right. That is what I am interested in. So, from the user's perspective, what you have been given are the two end points and the two end tangent vectors. This is what you have, right. So, now without uh, sort of loss of generality, I can consider this to be 0 and some value there which could refer to T2. it does not hurt for me to assume. So, if I say T 1 equals to 0, then the curve here, the parametric definition of the curve at T 1 equals to 0 is nothing but P 1, right. The value of the curve at T 2 is nothing but P 2. So, these are the end conditions I have. The derivative at t equals to 0 is nothing but the tangent vector at the end point p 1 and the derivative at t 2 is nothing but the tangent vector at the other end. So, this is what I have basically given the end conditions whatever is given to me right. Okay. So, with this now I have seen the definition of the parametric curve in terms of the coefficients b i's right, which is nothing but this right. So, if I am trying to evaluate the curve at t is equal to t 2, all it is saying that I evaluate this at t is equal to t 2 right, which is this all I have done is substitute t is equal to t 2 in that polynomial definition which I had considered right, which is nothing but p 2. So, what am I trying to do here? I am trying to find out the b i's given the end conditions to me because that is what that is what user has given to me in order that I design or obtain the parametric curve, I should find out the values of b i s. That is all I am doing, right. So, for that I am setting up the system equations which I would solve, that is all, right. So, similarly I take the derivative at t is equal to 0, right, which is given as this which by substituting I obtain b 2 is equal to p 1 prime, right. Similarly, I take the derivative at t is equal to t 2, that is what I get and I substitute that as p 2 prime, right. So, I know b 1 is equal to p 1 here. I know b 2 is equal to p 1 prime here, right. I just need to solve b 3 and b 4 from these two, right. 
Okay, so by solving uh, B1, B2, B3, and B4, I get these. Right. So, what do I have now? I have basically the the curve, right? Given p one, p two, p one prime, and p two prime, I have the the spline curve, right? Okay. So, having done to this extent, how would you now extend the idea of having more than two points, right. So, what I am trying to say is that we had the conditions at the two end points given the position and the end tangent vectors. Now, let us say a general uh, problem would be that I have set of points, right and I would like to have a spline going through those points right that is what I want to achieve. So, the problem is that can I extend this idea which I did just between two points right the answer should be yes so that is what we will do. So, uh, Okay, so this is what I have basically written the the entire uh, curve as p t in terms of the given values p's and p primes, position and the tangent vectors. Right, so the whole curve is known now. Okay, so now what we are saying is that let's say so first extend the idea from one segment to two segments and that we can then we can generalize it right. So, I have one segment here and another segment here right. So, the position vectors are let us say p 1, p 2, p 3 this is the point information I have and the tangent vectors are p 1 prime, p 2 prime and p 3 prime right. Now, for practical purposes what may happen is that for the two end positions it will be all right if you supply the end tangent vectors right, but it, will, it may be difficult to have the values of the tangent vectors at these points right. So, maybe I should be able to find out these tangent vectors given certain constraint for the type of curve I want to obtain right. So, what we basically do is we find out the intermediate tangent vector which is p 2 prime at this point through some constraint of continuity about the curve. right. So, we impose some constraint on the curve and find out this value right. So, now uh, if I look at a piecewise spline that means several segments of spline of let us say degree k then it has continuity of order k minus 1 at the internal joints right. So, the simplest example is that if I let us say consider piece wise line polyline right at the junction of the two lines. So, it is a it is a spline of a degree 1 right it is the first degree spline. So, if I look at the continuity at the junction point what do I have a continuity of 0 order which basically says that only the position match right. 
the end point of the first segment is the same as the first point of the subsequent segment. So, the positions at that point are the same. So, I call that as continuity of order 0. Right. So, for a general spline of degree k, I can have the continuity of order k minus 1. Fine. So, this is what I impose on the curve to find out the intermediate tangent vectors. Right. So, for finding out the P 2 prime, I say that P 2 double prime, which is the second order derivative is continuous over the joint. Right. Is it ok? Ok. So, once I do this, so basically I do the evaluation of P double prime T, right which is given as this and then I do the evaluation at let us say t is equal to t 2 for the first segment. right? So, again I can consider that this is the segment which could be defined within a parameter 0 and t 2, this is the segment which could be defined between 0 and t 3. right? So, the first segment which I consider I evaluate p double prime for this point right which is this and then for the second segment i do the evaluation of again p double prime at t is equal to 0 right so i get these two equations right and i want this to be the same that's the constraint i'm imposing Right. So, that is what it means for the segment first I have this and for this is the value for the second segment I just equate them. Right. So, this gives me extra equations right. and now I can substitute the expressions for B th B 4 and B 3. right? to solve the values for p 2 prime. Remember these are actually expressible in terms of the derivatives right when we looked at the individual segments. So, what it leads to is if you do a rearrangement of the terms what you may get is something like this. So, there are terms containing the the derivatives p 1 prime, p 2 prime, p 3 prime right and this is what you have on the right side right which I can write it in some sort of a matrix form right. This, this is the, the multiplication 2 p 1 prime, p 2 prime and p 3 prime and this is what I have at the right hand side. Right. So, now what I can do is so this is between two segments, this is between two segments right. If see if I was to solve only for two segments given p 1 prime and p 3 prime I could have got the value of p 2 prime and that is what I required right. Now, in fact, I can extend this to a general setting where I can consider any number of segments. So, now extending this for the kth and the for kth plus oneth segment, where I have let us say k going from 1 to n minus 2, this would be the equation right. All I am doing is basically if you just look at this, 
where I was solving for p 2 prime, now I will solve it for p k plus 1 prime. Right. Now, this would basically enable me to set this n minus 2 equations right for the various segments and then I can solve these p k primes. Right. So, what does this give me is basically gives me this a kind of a matrix right where i have these n minus 2 entries and i have these tangent vectors right and these are the corresponding right hand sides now uh, Clearly, so what I am trying to solve? I am trying to solve these, right. So, this is actually a matrix of n minus 2 rows, right. So, I cannot invert it, this is not a square matrix, right. But remember, we are given these values the two n tangent vectors right. So, I can actually have additional rows into the matrix without changing anything. So, that is what I mean. So, I can add this row and this row right and correspondingly add these values on the right hand side. Right. So, now this sets up a square matrix here which I can easily invert. Well, I may not choose to do the matrix inversion as used in general case because this is a tri diagonal system, right? diagonally dominant matrix. So, there could be better ways to solve it. Okay, so, we basically have set the system of equations for solving these derivatives or the tangent vectors and that is what we require. Okay. So, if I solve uh, now b 1, b 2, b 3 and b 4 for the kth segment, this is what I would get. right because i am interested in finding out these b i k s let us say so that i can do now segment by segment plot of the curve right i can basically obtain the curve for each segment so just to have a different uh, Re rearrangement of that. What I have done is I have written these b i k values again in some sort of a matrix which is basically the multiplication coefficients of these values. Right. So, here again we see something which is pertaining to the position of the point and the tangent vectors. Right. Now, again uh, going back to the individual segment of the cubic spline which is defined as this right. I can rewrite this in this form which is the monomial form right where I use the coefficients for 1 t t square and t cube and these are the coefficients right and again substitute for b i k s that is what I get right. So, this is the substitution for b i k s right. 
So, what do I ob obtain here? Some multiplication this which is the multiplication of this and this with information given as the position and the tangent vectors. Right. So, now let us say if I substitute for some t over t k plus 1 as u some another variable then I can rewrite this as p k u as something like this right where each of these polynomials f 1 f 2 f 3 f 4 can be written in this form right. Now, this basically I call that as some sort of a blending function right. So, what are they doing? They are trying to blend information given to us in the form of position and tangent vector. Right. So, these are basically some blending functions or basis. Right. So, if you want to see now the equation for a cubic spline, what you observe is that there is some blending function here given through f and there is some g which is basically the geometrical information which was given to you. Right. So, the geometrical information which was given to us was in the form of position and tangent vectors. Right. So, all we are trying to say is that there is set of these blending functions by using these blending functions for the information which was given we can generate the cubic splines. Right. Right. We found the parametric. Uh, we found the bi's. Does that? Uh, did that completely determine the curve? That's right. It did. So then, what is the point of uh, adding on new points and uh, then finding out for each segment the separate? Spline? Right. Right. So try to look at the definition pro of the problem. The first which we considered was I was given two points and the corresponding tangent vectors at those two points and I could derive a spline satisfying these. So, it is a curve satisfying these end conditions the okay. position and the two end tangent vectors Thanks. right. Now, generally what you have is you have set of points right set of end points let us say and what you want to design a curve passing through these points right with certain properties okay. and when I say certain properties they are reflecting towards the smoothness of the curve right and the shape of the curve. Now, what we are trying to do here is we want to extend the idea which we consider for two points to this n set of points. Okay. So, it is again that is why I said it is a piece wise spline with the constraint of continuity which is captured through second derivative to be the same at the internal points right. And you also look at from the pragmatics point of view if I have let us say n set of points right. I may be able to either deduce or supply the n tangent vectors at the two end points, but this is overkilling if I require two n tangent vector n tangent vectors for each segment right and then how do I match them right. If, if some segment is giving me individually the end tangent vectors and they are they are not the same then there is no continuity 
right. So, from the point of, of design, this is a desirable thing to have, right, okay. So, so what we have basically established that there is some sort of a blending of the information given as some geometrical information to us to be able to get the these splines. That is what we have basically established, right. So, just see a little more carefully these blending functions. So, if I make a plot of these f, right. So, f 1 looks like this, f 2 looks like this and this is f 3 and this is f 4, right. These are just the plots for u ranging between 0 and 1. Here I have called this as t, right. So, if you look at now the values of this function f 1 at 0 is equal to 1, f 2 at 0 is equal to 0, f 3 at 0 is equal to 0, f 4 at 0 is equal to 0, which means that the curve passes through p 1, right. So, it is some, some sort of a cardinality. You have if you look at the this guy, right. So, there you have the information of the position and then tangent vectors, right. So, when you use at t is equal to 0, there is only one of them is 1 and the rest of them are 0, right. Similarly, if you evaluate at t is equal to 1, right, what you observe is that f 4 is f 2 is 1 and the rest of them are 0, which says that you have the curve interpolating the point p 2, right. And you also observe that f 2 and f 4 for instance, they are symmetric, right. So, f 2 is equal to 1 minus f 1 and f 4 is 1 minus f 3, right. So, they are also symmetric functions, right. And the other thing what you observe is the relative magnitudes of these. So, you observe that f 1 and f 2 are fairly larger than f 3 and f 4, right. What does it mean? If you look at from the influence point of view, right, the f 1 and f 2 are doing what? They are trying to do blending of information coming as position vectors. Whereas, f 3 and f 4, they are the functions related to the end tangent vectors, right. So, the sensitivity of the curve with respect to the position vector and the end tangent vector are basically demonstrated by this relative magnitude. right. So, the change of position is sort of more influential let us say than the end tangent vectors towards the shape of the curve. Fine. So, uh, now what we also see that we can obtain the whole cubic spline, piecewise cubic spline by the position vector, the tangent vectors and the parameter values because this is also required. You need these parameters, right, the t k values. So, the value of t k can actually be chosen either as a chord length parameterization that we will discuss later on or also as uniform parameterization. That means, just take equals between 0 and 1, 0 and 1. Right. So, if I consider t k is equal to 1 for all k, then it has a uniform parameterization 
and the kind of spline we obtain is called normalized spline. Okay, so, all T k's are basically considered as 1. So, if you if you do that then the, uh, the, the evaluation of these functions basically looks like this. Right, and if you write it in this matrix form, then the blending functions what we obtain are called as Hermit polynomial functions. Okay, so these are just special cases for cubic splines. Now, if you uh, look at the total set of equations we have, this is how your tridiagonal matrix will look if you have normalized spline. Okay, so, which is in this case turns out to be a constant matrix, which could be beneficial for the computational point of view. Right? Because if you have to invert this, you just have to invert it once. Right, it's a constant matrix. Okay, so these are basically normalized cubic splines. Now there is one thing uh, which we also have looked at is the end conditions which are given to you. So we consider that the first and the last tangent vectors were given right? and we obtained the intermediate tangent vectors. So, if we have that as an end condition, we call that as clamped end condition. Right? So, you are basically clamping the two ends. <coughs> now, you may have end conditions saying that the uh, second derivative at the two end points goes to 0. Right? So, that we call it as relaxed or natural end condition. Now, with this clearly there will be a change in the first row of the matrix we have seen. Right? So, this is going to give you additional equations which you need to incorporate in the set of equations. Right? Similarly, we have the cyclic end conditions. So, where we say that the two ends match in terms of the first derivative and in terms of the second derivative. Right? So, this is relevant in what situations? <coughs> closed curves. If you have a closed curve, you would like that wherever you are closing the curve, these two end conditions match. Right? And we also have should be one the anti cyclic conditions where we would like to have the first derivative and the sec second derivative as the complement of these this is a minus here okay where would you have that as a situation as a desirable situation You play uh, any game with the racket, tennis or squash or badminton. So, you notice the shape. Not really. So, let me uh, draw the shape of the racket and you will probably notice it.
So, you see that is the head part of the racket. You go in one direction and come back in the opposite direction and that is where you need to have the anticyclic end conditions. The signs are just the, just the reverse. So, that basically gives us another end conditions which we may want to use it for the design of curves. So, let me stop here. I will continue on the parametric curves again in the next class. Thank you.